This car is probably too rough for Ed Bolian. One of the hardest things for me to do in the car business is transact Corvettes. In the Porsche world, and especially the Ferrari world, people are willing to pay a premium for condition and uh, for good documentation. They will pay more for a nine and a half out of 10 car than they will an eight out of 10 car. There's always the bottom feeders, but since Ed Bolian is not my target demographic of buyer, then I'm uh, looking for the people who are willing to pay more for a better product. Because of that, I've pretty much stopped selling Corvettes. It's just not worth it to me. And I think there's actually an, an article, I haven't read it yet, but somebody said that the C5 Corvette was the one that essentially like ruined the Corvette market because they had made it so accessible that any margins on the used market and on the new just disappeared. And the Nissan GTR was like that actually as well. I made a lot of money flipping them originally when there was a arbitrary amount over MSRP that you could ask. But then once they went on the used market, it was like wholesale was 68 and retail was 69. That's just not worth it to me. So Corvettes tend to be the same way. Every time I get in a Corvette, I'll pay up for it because I'm like, man, this is the cleanest one I've ever seen. Great maintenance history, maybe some nice upgrades. And then it just sits and sits and sits. And buyers are just like, oh, I can buy this one on eBay for $800 less. I found this one for $200 less. I'm like, it has twice the mileage or, you know, any rationale that I would use on any other car that just doesn't seem to phase Corvette buyers. So I figured this was a problem limited only to the people on the buying side. Well, recently I was hired by a local exotic car rental company in Cleveland called Dream Car Adventures to uh, assemble a fleet of cars for them. And in this was a Corvette C7, either a, a Stingray or a Z06. I thought this was a walk in the park. I had already sourced them a Ferrari California, Lamborghini LP560 Gallardo, and a Bentley GTC, and had done very well for them. Found some uh, pretty clean cars that weren't perfect, but were very nice. And I thought a Corvette, man, this will be easy. All the buyers are cheap, so I'll be able to get a good buy on the other end. Turns out the sellers are just as annoying to deal with as the buyers. I have to hand it to Corvette Mike to buy a vet to all these places that exclusively do vets. They must have figured out how to deal with these people. I can't do it. This is a gross stereotype here, but you know, it must be the, the fiberglass fumes or something that make this cross section of, of buyers and sellers more difficult to deal with. And it's maybe why I haven't joined the Corvette club yet. So mine isn't for sale for any rational amount of money but mine also isn't actively for sale. It seems like the people trying to sell their cars also aren't willing to sell it for any rational amount of money. Now, in, in trying to find this car, I joined the Corvette Buy Sell Trade Group on Facebook thinking, man, this'll, this'll really help out. So within this Facebook group, you know, all the sellers were asking way too much and all the comments were basically just vitriolic saying, oh, you're out of your mind. But the interesting thing was, is every Corvette owner had a one of one car because it was, you know, one of this color with this particular options built on this Monday at the factory. And, you know, so, so every Corvette was rare, even though they've made millions of them. And it made me think of the regular car reviews video, which is probably one of the best ones ever and sums up the Corvette owner stereotype where he goes to, I think, Carlisle and just goes around going, my Corvette is best Corvette because I have an airbrushing on the hood. My Corvette is best Corvette because I have a matching trailer. So that seemed to be what I was encountering. Nobody wanted to negotiate on their prices. Nobody was open to realistic offers. And this searching for a Corvette, which I thought would be the easiest thing in the world, turned out to be one of the hardest assignments I had ever had. You know, the auction pricing was darn near what retail was. So I wasn't able to pull any margin either. So I'm like, I'm having to work the hardest ever for the least possible return. And I'm thinking, man, these dealers must just 
make it all up on the back end. You know, they're stocking their lots with Corvettes and just saying, all right, well, we'll charge financing to everybody. And I, I actually did experience that. I found one that was priced essentially at wholesale value. So I looked up the feedback from the dealer. They had a pretty sketchy reputation and a lot of complaints for not being willing to sell the car for the advertised price. So I figured I'd try that theory out. So I called them up and tried to buy the car for the advertised price. And I couldn't. First of all, they said that it didn't include a $2,000 down payment, which I said, well, that wasn't in your description. So I said, listen, I'm a dealer. I would like to wire you the money and come get the car. No, 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 we can't sell it to anybody out of state. I said, why not? Well, you have to come take delivery of the car. We don't ship cars. I'm like, that's fine. I'll fly in there tomorrow. And they just kept finding excuses as to why they wouldn't sell me the car at their advertised price. And a couple days later, the price on the internet changed. Not surprisingly. I was really baffled as to why these prices were so high from the private owners anyway. I figured that all of their friends are so sick of hearing about how special their cars are that uh, they put it out there so people will call and insult them for their asking price just so they can have another opportunity to explain just how special and unique their one-of-one -one Corvette is. Now I say that, but I may be the pot calling the kettle black because my Corvette is a 98 convertible in light carmine red and it's the only year they made that color in the convertible and please don't call it anniversary red because it's lighter than that and has more copper flake in it and they only made like 300 in that color and i have the tan interior and it's a manual so yeah if i ever sell mine i'm gonna be that idiot too but anyway let's get down to the corvette i finally found so i found a corvette Stingray that had a bunch of Z06 stuff on it. So it looked like a Z06 and it had higher mileage. It had a bad Carfax, but not a terrible Carfax. So it had a, a couple minor damage reports. So um, still a little too clean for Ed. I'm like, man, this, this looks good. It was like 34 grand. It was on the low end of the scale. So I'm like, all right, I think this is actually perfect for a rental company because it's not perfect cosmetically. We're not paying the premium for Z06, but it looks like a Z06. So it's great marketing for them. So I got the okay from the uh, the rental car company and proceeded to try to buy it. And of course I did my due diligence. I checked out the seller. There were a very reputable Corvette auction facility, we'll say, somewhere south of Ohio and well known in the Corvette community. So I said, okay, well, this, this seems like a good bet. My buyer was actually told that the car was very nice, just a few minor cosmetic imperfections. And he said, you will be blown away by this car. Well, he was right. The car showed up while I was on vacation. And uh, I asked my detailer, I said, hey, um, how's it look? Said, well, to be honest, it's, it's pretty rough. Okay, well, how bad is it? So he started describing how bad it was and he did not exaggerate. It had poor prior paint work. It had sagging and lifting upper dash panel. It had excessive seat wear. It had body panels that didn't fit properly. It had cracks in the fiberglass in the rear fender and the door. Uh, it was missing clips in the front bumper, so that was loose. The Z06 wheels, which they had put on, they did not properly put uh, fender extensions on so they stuck out about this far from the body. The Z07 rear spoiler had been mounted with drywall screws and not mounted well. There was actually extra holes and on one side it wasn't mounted at all. So apparently somebody had given up on trying to finish the job. So I said you, you need to send me pictures of all this stuff because that's that's more than a little rough. That's uh, That's a big problem. So I called and texted the owner of this Corvette uh, facility. I said, we got a problem. This car is nowhere near as described. This car is probably too rough 
for Ed Bolian. He proceeded to defend the car and say, no, 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 that's normal wear for 60,000 miles. I'm like, listen, this is not normal wear for 60,000 mile Corvette. I've had a couple Corvettes at 60,000 miles and they were perfect. I mean, I could expect maybe a, a glove box full of lottery tickets or, you know, if, if the matching Corvette jacket that came with it was a little bit ripped and smelled like smoke, you know, I, I could live with that. Th those are normal uh, Corvette wear things. Or, you know, if it had too many um, Corvette Club meetup stickers on the back window or, you know, if, if the CB mount was, was bent or something like that. But th this was completely unacceptable, even for a rental car. So I said, there's money coming back. You're either taking this car back or there's a significant amount of money coming back to me. And he goes, well, I, I don't want the car back. I'm like, yeah, <laughs> no kidding. So he goes, well, how much money would you want? And I said, ah, I think I want $2,500. He goes, oh, that's a lot. I go, well, that's going to take that to make it right. Plus, it's going to be a lot of hassle. So he said, well, how about two grand? I said, nah, I don't think that's going to do it. But let me, let me think about what I want to do here and I'll call you back. So I hung up with him and then I, uh, Matt, while he's detailing it, is finding more flaws and he keeps texting me more photos. And I'm like, oh man, this is, this is not good. So I was actually elated that he had not taken my $2,500 offer because if he had, I would have to stand by that. And I was more elated that I didn't take his counter offer. Um, so thankfully I had no obligation to take any amount of money from him at this point because my wife who's a wonderful sounding board and puts up with all my stories from, from work, but is, uh, great at advising me. She just looked at me and said, do you really want to deal with all of that? I mean, you got enough on your plate. And I was like, you know what? No, I don't like, even if he gave me 10 grand, I don't think I want to deal with the hassle of trying to get all this stuff fixed and cleaned up and get the car right, uh, for the client. So I called him back and said, wire me the money back. This, there's, there's not a question about this. You're going to take the car back. You know what you did. You can spin it however you want. You can give me all the car salesman lines. I'm not an idiot. Like this car must go back. And surprisingly, he said, okay. And by 2 p.m. that day, the money was back in my account. And I have to hand it to him because I've dealt with a lot of shady people before and uh, most of them are not actually going to admit they're wrong and send you the money back. So I, I think what happened is the car probably didn't sell at his annual Corvette auction and for good reason and he knew exactly what he was representing or misrepresenting and he was just hoping to find a sucker that didn't really... Uh, have good eyes or <laughs> forgot his bifocals when he took delivery of the car and I was the wrong guy to buy it. And so he took it back and he'll pawn it off on another sucker, I guess. I have to hand it to him that he, he sent the money back and all that meant was now I have to restart the search for another Corvette. So actually in my desperation and my lack of success on all of the wholesale sites, all of the retail sites, all my normal avenues, I put a want to buy ad out on Instagram. Basically a plea for help. I need a Corvette that I can buy from somebody who isn't the stereotypical Corvette guy that thinks their car's worth the moon. Thankfully, I found one. Somebody tagged their friend in it and he was looking to sell his Corvette and it was a Z06 with a Z07 package and it had a few miles on it and a few minor upgrades. It seemed to be the perfect car and he wasn't asking too much money. We ended up sealing a deal and what actually helped the deal out was that both CarMax and uh, I think Criswell Chevrolet had offered him like seven grand less than I ended up buying the car from him for. Which kind of confused me because I said, man, this is these Corvette guys, they all want top money for their car. Yet Criswell is the, probably the largest retailer of Corvettes in the country, and they just lowballed the crap out of him, like five grand below wholesale. You know, I don't know if it's just that the guys need the money for their, their bingo night or something like that, but apparently they must take these offers and and that's how other dealers make money on Corvettes is just buying them for far less than they're worth so that they can then advertise them for uh, what uh, the average Corvette buyer is willing to pay. So them offering 
whopping $53,000, which was less than wholesale for a non-Z07 Z06 Corvette, allowed me to swoop in and buy it for a pretty good deal at $60,000. And the seller was very happy. The rental company was happy. And uh, it's already been booked a couple times. And uh, actually, somebody's rented it out for a cross-country trip. So I don't know if that's for just a leisure trip with his favorite Hooters waitress, or if it's a trip to a big Corvette meet where he can say, my Corvette is best Corvette because my name is not on the title. Or maybe if it's for a cannonball attempt. But I guess only time and the GPS records will tell. I take all sorts of forms of payment, not including Bitcoin or private tutoring. So every car guy has an irrational penchant for a certain car that maybe nobody else loves, maybe a few other weird people do. One of mine is the Aston Martin DB7 GT. Now I love the standard DB7 just for the styling. I think that era Aston Martin is unquestionably beautiful and certainly much more beautiful than the, the pigs coming out of the 80s from the same company. And well, pretty much from every automotive company at that time period. In particular, the Vantage because of the V12 engine and the vastly improved suspension over the regular DB7. But then the GT is the pinnacle of the DB7 design. They actually took a grand touring car and made it as close to a real sports car as you could. Bigger Brembo brakes in front, I think they were 14 inch rotors, and again, more finely tuned suspension over the regular Vantage. A little bit of extra horsepower, not much, but enough and some other cosmetic touches as well, including an integrated fiberglass rear spoiler into the rear deck lid and a different hood, which is now about $7,000 to get if you wanted to, you know, make your regular Vantage look like a GT. True to Aston Martin form, making parts unobtainium by their prices. So, and of course in 03, that was the tail end of the DB7 production, and it was right at the beginning of the Vanquish production, which was Aston Martin's flagship car. That was the car that got all the attention that everybody loved at the time. As with good authors and artists, they're never appreciated in their time. And I think that'll be true of the DB7 GT as well, because the Vanquishes are starting to become very unloved because of their horrendously unreliable and expensive transmissions, except for the few that have been converted by Aston Martin Works to a manual. And the DB7 GT is actually reasonably reliable for a British car, and it's a manual, and I think it is a true driver's car. It's beautiful, it sounds good, and it is absolutely a, a thrill to drive. You know, some drawbacks certainly, the dashes like to shrink, as pretty much any British or Italian car does, and there's no vertical height adjustment in the driver's seat, so if uh, you are taller than extra medium, you're probably going to hit your head on the roof. True car guys find their way around those types of obstacles for a car they love. The DB7 GT, they actually made more manuals than automatics. I would have to check VinWiki on this, but according to the Nuts for Sticks database anyway, there's 64 manuals and there's 17 automatics made for the US. And the automatics were called the GTA. Now it's rare, I think, for a collectible car to have fewer automatics, but in this case, rarity does not equal desirability, as the automatics tend to trade for 35 to 45 grand, and that the manuals trade in the 50 to 80 thousand dollar range, depending on color and mileage and condition. Now I've been tracking the GT manuals for quite a while. Now I've transacted probably about 50% of the ones that have sold in the last five years, which is about six. <laughs> Most of them are still with their original owners and they don't come up for sale very often. But I had a unique opportunity to sell a DB7 GTA. And it was actually about a two year process that started with a friend of mine emailing me one of his friends listings for sale and it was this db7 gta and he was asking about sixty-five thousand. i said well thank you for the lead but the guy's out of his mind we communicated briefly and i thought it was worth maybe forty thousand dollars and he of course thought i was equally as insane and 
I think like two years later, he circled back because he'd been trying to sell the car the whole time. And he finally was just like, I want to wash my hands of it. Please buy it. And I bought it for maybe 35 grand, something like that, and immediately sold it to one of my clients who wanted to try an Aston Martin and didn't have the same need for a third pedal that I did. So he thought it was a great deal. So he loved it for a little bit and then traded it back in as his his pattern. Uh, about every three to four months, he wants to try something else. So I put it up for sale again. Now, before putting it up for sale, we sent it to one of our local shops to have serviced. And it was there a little bit longer than normal because we were trying to figure out some evaporative system issues because when you tried to put the fuel in, it would keep backing up. And there was some issue somewhere within the evaporative system that was, uh, again, true to British car form, very difficult to chase down. So while it was there, it uh, did sit outside, which is not uncommon for a lot of shops. That little detail of it sitting outside became a, a pretty big deal. Frank up at the shop called me one day and he goes, think you need to come in. That's never, never a good phone call. It's never a phrase you wanna hear because it either means, hey, you need to look at what I'm about to fix that's gonna cost you thousands of dollars or you need to come see in person why I backed into your car or something like that. We've all heard the horror stories and some people have experienced the horror stories of techs uh, wrecking their cars and uh, nobody ever wants to get that phone call. But this one was a little bit different. So I show up to the shop and proceed to find black marks, like tar, all over one side of the car. I'm like, what in the heck is that? And he goes, well, uh, the neighbor's parking lot was seal coated over the weekend and it looks like they got some overspray on the car. I was like, wow, that's that's unfortunate. So we go next door to kind of check it out from the other side of the chain link fence, and it quickly becomes apparent that this probably wasn't a case of the guy, you know, losing control of his seal coating wand. It, it looked pretty deliberate because, I mean, these guys know what they're doing. You, you could see where they had painted just perfectly along the curb, and then, all of a sudden, there was just a line on the fence, on the other side of which was the Aston Martin, where they somehow missed the ground and went eight feet in the air and got the entire fence. The Aston was parked in a corner next to the fence, so it continued around here and stopped again at the edge of the Aston Martin. So I'm like, wow, somebody didn't like David Brown or just, I don't know what, but apparently somebody was having a bad day. So we filed a police report because uh, we had to get it on record in case it was indeed malicious. And we determined the name of the seal coating company from the neighbor so that we could call them and inform them that they needed to pay for their misdeeds. Now, while doing that, of course, I had it sent to a detail shop so we could determine what the extent of the damage was. You know, here I am thinking, essentially, this car is gonna need a full repaint repaint plus diminished value, this could be tens of thousands of dollars. And that's going to be a big fight because I don't think anybody wants to shell out that kind of money for a stupid little vandalism. So while I'm determining what the extent of the damage is, we're trying to talk to this company to get them to agree that this was a bad thing that they did and, and they should pay us for it. And it turns out that the, the name of the company, I won't uh, give it away, but it implied that it was people that teach that also seal coat. So I guess they do it in the summer during their, their summer break. But Frank brought up an interesting point. He said, well, you know, if this is vandalism, that can be a felony. If that gets on their record, they'll lose their teaching license and they will no longer be people that educate and seal coat. They will be people that only seal coat. <laughs> So we had a little bit of leverage there. Initially, he seemed very amicable to paying for the damage and said, you know, I'll, I'll file an insurance claim, you know, not a problem. But he, he certainly wouldn't admit any guilt that, you know, was something he did intentionally. But as time went on, I started getting somewhat cryptic and dodgy texts from him as to why he couldn't file an insurance claim or hadn't filed one yet. 
you know, he didn't want that on his insurance record, didn't want to pay the deductible, all sorts of things like that that are making me think, man, this, this guy is a real deadbeat and I'm going to probably end up in court over this. Thankfully, during that time, I got the report back from the detailing shop and they said, yes, indeed, this will buff out. So I had them just complete the work because I wasn't going to let that sit on the car forever because that could cause worse problems. So I said, let's just fix it. I'll pay the $1,500, get the car back ready for sale, and then deal with this teacher on the side. We got it all fixed up, got it back into my inventory, and uh, continued to pursue this guy for the, the measly $1,500 that he now owed. And we had given him quite a scare because initially I said, hey, this car may need to be repainted and you're on the hook for all of this. So I thought that when I said, hey, look, you only owe me 1500 bucks, he would be elated and just run to drop the cash off to me. And as is the case with most deadbeats and automotive brokers, he stalled and made up excuses and continued to make up excuses, all the while promising, oh yeah, 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 no, we'll, we'll, we'll make this right. And I'm like, okay, well, it's, it's very easy to make it right. It's called $1,500. I take all sorts of forms of payment, not including Bitcoin or private tutoring. He kept dragging this out so long that uh, the, the police officer who was handling this was fantastic. And he stopped by Frank's shop to just kind of check in and say, hey, how's things going with this? Because he had some interest in seeing it resolved as well. He was pretty perturbed about it and, you know, just wanted to see justice done. So while he was at Frank's shop, Frank told him the story and said how this guy was delaying and that really uh, chapped the cops. I think. And so he got on the phone and called him old school cop style and just said, Hey, listen, I'm going to come pay you a visit because this is a vandalism charge. If you don't get this resolved and if you don't get it resolved today, you're going to be arrested for vandalism and you're probably going to lose your teacher's license. And I don't know what else he said. I'm summarizing because I wasn't there, but whatever he said was effective because about five minutes later, Mr teacher called me with a credit card number to pay for the $1,500 in damage. And at that point, I wasn't going to squawk about the 3% that it cost me to run his credit card. I was just thankful that the cop did his job, that he was willing to put some uh, good old school pressure on the guy to, to pay his bill such that we didn't have to go through a massive legal battle. As much as I can be vindictive sometimes in, in my heart, I never want to see somebody truly lose their ability to, to do their profession. And I'm sure he was probably a, a better teacher than he was seal coder. The DB7 itself is in wonderful condition. There was no lasting damage and it polished out beautifully and, and got a full paint correction and, and polish in the meantime. So it actually looked better. And uh, the new owner loved it for a few years and just recently sold it through RM at Monterey. So it's now with another new owner who will, I'm sure, love it and uh, beat the tar out of it. I would like to think, I don't know if this actually happened, but I would like to think that in the conversation with the cop and the teacher uh, slash seal coder, that the, the cop said something to the effect of, you know, if you don't pay this and you get a felony on your record, it'll be your own ass fault. I didn't really want to send a quarter of a million dollars back just because a trucker was two days late. Most people, when they ship a car, they'll just call intercity or reliable carriers or whatever. They'll get in this queue and they'll get to it when they get to it. So they might not even pick up your car for two to three weeks. And you don't know that going in. You're just waiting for a truck that's happening to go that route. So if you want something done quickly, the average consumer has to go through a broker. I, of course, have access to a special load board that allows me to get truckers directly. And that's usually when these adventures start happening because you sometimes scrape the bottom of the barrel. The brokers do not always weed out who is actually shipping the truck. They're just going with the cheapest guy because they don't really care about your car. They just take their 200 bucks and 
move along. One of the most stressful ones was when I was shipping my Nissan GTR to Las Vegas from Ohio. And I had to get it there in a week because I had a, a big event at my dealership in Vegas and I needed it there for that because I was gonna give demo rides to people on the track. So I contracted with the company and I said, I need the car there on Friday. No problem, the guy has to be out there anyway for something else. So the trucker shows up, I talk to him and I say, just to confirm, you're going to be in Vegas by Friday, right? Absolutely, yep, no problem, I will be there. You, you'll have your car for your event. I said, okay, because if not, don't even take the car. He loads the car, I fly out to Vegas. Wednesday rolls around, I call the company. Hey, where are you at? Oh, he's in Arkansas, something like that. Uh, not making great time, but okay. Thursday rolls around. I say, hey, where are you at? He said, well, I actually, I broke down and I'm at this truck stop getting my truck fixed. I said, okay, where? And he said, well, I'm in, I think it was Arkansas, something like that. And he said, I'm at the, the Peterbilt truck stop. I said, okay, which one? I looked him up, there's two. I said, I'm gonna fly in, come find you and just drive my car back because it's a day drive, I can still make it back. And he couldn't tell me which one he was at. So I called the owner of the trucking company. I said, where's your guy? Oh yeah, yeah, he's broke down, this and that. I said, I need to know where I'm going to get my car. Couldn't give me a straight answer. So after getting a bunch of runaround, I just said, forget this. I called up the owner of the trucking company. I said, you need to tell me where your guy is at. Otherwise I'm calling the Arkansas State Police and registering my car as stolen. Tell me where my car is. So turns out he was actually in Memphis. The guy decided to go home for the weekend because he's from Memphis. So he was at a Peterbilt truck stop, but not in Arkansas. He was not broken down. He was, he wanted some barbecue. I was livid because I said, you guys guaranteed me delivery on Friday and you had absolutely zero intentions of doing this. And not only that, you as the owner of the company lied to cover up your trucker. The same thing. I said, listen, I know where he's at. Um, I'm sending somebody by to get his license plate number and all that. And I said, uh, I have another truck I've booked to pick up the car from him. No, 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 we're not gonna release it. You've, you know, you have to pay us for the shipment. I said, once again, if you don't unload that car and give it to the other trucker, I'm calling the police, my car's stolen. Okay, fine, fine, we'll let it go. So I had a, a buddy of mine from Memphis go by, make sure he was actually at the truck stop and talk to the trucker. And then I had another uh, company go by and pick my car up off that truck and take it to me in Vegas, not by Friday, but it arrived <laughs> without detour. I did not pay them. Speaking of not paying, when the Porsche GT2 came out in 2008, I had one of the first ones and I sold it to a longtime good customer of mine in California. Given that he paid so much money over sticker, he wanted it right away. He deserved that. So again, I contracted with a company and said, I need the car there, guaranteed delivery by Saturday. I will pay whatever it takes to guarantee delivery because usually companies won't guarantee delivery unless you basically buy out the whole truck. No, we'll charge you regular price. We have to be there this weekend anyway for a couple of other things. And I went back and forth. I said, no, I will pay you extra. I need guaranteed delivery. And this is a big reputable company. Nope, we'll charge you normal price. The car will be there on Friday. Okay, picked up the GT2 on its way. Friday rolls around, nothing. Can't get a hold of the company, never heard from the trucker. Saturday rolls around, still nothing. So because it's a big company, they refuse to give us the trucker's actual number. And so they're sitting there waiting for the car and we can't get a hold of anybody going through their you know automated system and I'm just like this is ridiculous so I guess the trucker finally called 
my customer and said, hey, you know, I got delayed something or other, I'll see you Monday. And the customer called me just absolutely livid. People with that kind of money, they change their mind based on their mood. And because he didn't have the car that Saturday, he wanted it to take to dinner or whatever, he was over it and he wanted to return the car. And I didn't really want to send a quarter of a million dollars back just because a trucker was two days late. Talked him down, I said, you know, I'm really sorry. It'll, it'll be there Monday, you know, if you still hate it, you can send it back or whatever, but let's try to keep this deal together and, you know, don't pay the trucker, obviously, I'll handle it with the transport company. So it got delivered Monday, he didn't pay the trucker, and so I called the company and, you know, aired my grievances and said, we're not going to be paying you because this was absolutely ridiculous. And I said, listen, if you have any issues, you deal with me. They called the customer on the delivery end, tried to get money from him. They called the Porsche dealer in New York from whom they had picked up the car, who had nothing to do with any of this, tried to get money from them. Called the broker who had arranged the shipment for me, tried to get money from them. And of course, all three of them, they said, oh, well, Doug isn't paying us this and that, and so we're just trying to get paid. So they, they threw me under the bus and called everybody else, ended up uh, losing my customer in California because of this. Um, and, and I don't blame him at all. I mean, they, it was completely unprofessional how they handled it. And in hindsight, I would have just given them the $1,500 to, to keep him as a customer, but I didn't think they'd pull that kind of juvenile move. I said, stop calling people. You call me if you have a problem. If you want to chase me for the money, fine, but you're not getting paid because you didn't do the job right and you didn't communicate. So a couple months go by, don't think anything more of it. Their attorney calls me, says, hey, I'm trying to get paid for this shipping job. And so I just told him the story and you hear him on the other end of the phone just go, oh, oh, I'm really sorry. We'll take care of this. Never heard from them again. <laughs> And that is, I, this is the first time in my life I've ever had a collections attorney apologize and say, oh, oh, wow, <laughs> that's bad. <laughs> One of the more odd things was I had a Nissan GTR delivered and I had a crispy piece of bacon just wrapped around the, the windshield wiper. And I'm kind of like, how did that get there? <laughs> that was one of the more odd things. But I had a, an Audi R8 picked up one time from an Audi dealer. And they called me after it got picked up and they're like, who the heck did you send to pick this up? I said, I, you know, I don't know. I used a broker, it's an enclosed carrier, all that. They go, I, I don't know about this guy. And they didn't really give me many details, but the car shows up to my shop and it was just a box truck. It wasn't even a car carrier. He didn't have E-Tracks, he didn't have a loading ramp. He didn't have any. It was just a box truck and my R8 in it. And he had basically parked it at an angle, turned the wheel all the way to the right. So the front tire was wedged against one side of the box truck and then just set the e-brake. So we had to hire a flatbed to come back up to this box truck to unload the R8. And everything ended up being fine. I mean, super sketchy, but I call this Audi dealer. I'm like, okay, you let him take the car. You should have just not let him take the car, but it ended up being fine. All's well that ends well. <laughs>I started at 20 years old out of my bedroom with $4,000 in my bank account and I didn't have a backer. Uh, I didn't have a PhD as they call, Papa had a dealer, you know. So I was just, I had to start somewhere and sell cars and, and work and claw my way up in the exotic car business, which is not easy to do because everybody's backed by guys with huge amounts of money. But I got an email one time from a broker that I deal with quite often 
and he was looking for a Porsche 993 GT2. And he said, hey, do you know of one of these? I said, yeah, I might. So I emailed one of my collector clients. I said, hey, do you have one of these I could have? He goes, well, I have three of them actually. And here's the, the two that are for sale. And one of them fit the bill. So I emailed the guy back, here's the price. And literally in about 10 emails, I made a deal on my first million dollar car. And it was one of the easiest deals I'd ever made. And yet it was such a milestone. After, after chasing so many of those elusive, you know, multi-million dollar deals where there's eight people and tons of moving parts and you can't actually get the VIN number on a car and all that crap, you know, in five emails, I had sold a million dollar car. So that was uh, pretty cool. I had secured a number of allocations for the Vesuvius Orange Range Rover Sport, which was all the rage. Um, and I would get allocations from Midwest dealers, advertise in Los Angeles and New York City and Miami and all the hot spots and, you know, sell the allocations. The dealers were more than happy because they sold the cars and the customers were more than happy to pay a small premium because their, you know, Beverly Hills Land Rover was charging $20,000 over sticker. So um, the measly few thousand dollars I was charging was a bargain. And uh, I got to sell some cars to some very interesting celebrities and things like that. I got on the list for a ton of Nissan GTRs. And that was one of the last cars I did because that was, you know, 2008, right before the recession. Um, and Nissan dealers were, of course, they were just happy to sell a car, you know, whatever. We've got this $80,000 car well, at the time. It was way less than that. They got this expensive car in that they get one of. They don't know what to do with it. So they're happy to sell it to me. And so I was, you know, selling a ton of those. But I, I really came into my stride with the GT3s. And I had secured uh, over a dozen allocations uh, number one slots at sticker for the GT3 RS, which at the time was impossible. I mean, they made about 400 for the U S and you know, most guys didn't get one. Um, uh, but I thought ahead and placed all the deposits and had contracts written in stone and all that. So the first one I sold, uh, for a whopping $40,000 over sticker. Those were the heydays, you know, where I could literally put out no money and make a bunch of money for flipping an allocation. Um, but not only do certain forum junkies see it as a moral evil, but also Porsche sees it as just the worst possible crime ever. So they started contacting the dealers because they all got together and said, who's this Doug person who has, you know, 15 GT3 RSs on order and how. Uh, so they had some corporate meeting uh, in New York and decided that they were going to shut me down. And so they started contacting these dealers and said, hey, if you sell that car to Doug, we will pull your franchise. They were threatening dealers to pull their Porsche franchise if they sold me a car. So I started getting letters back from the dealers, refunding my deposits, this and that. Um, I did end up getting, I think, two cars total out of the 15 or so that I were legally contractually obligated to me. The irony of it was in all of this, their reasoning for returning the deposits was, well, you can't buy it because you're planning to resell it, which is of course a violation of antitrust law. Um, but I kept track of the VINs of these cars I had ordered and almost all of them went to some lawyer in Florida or some Renless super member in New York or some PCA enthusiast DE instructor in, you know, Nebraska who all then proceeded to put them on eBay and flip them for an enormous profit. So all the people who preached against this just did the same. Um, but it was interesting because uh, a high up guy from Porsche called me and tried to trap me into admitting that I was reselling them. And I'm like, Hey, yeah, I am. So what, you know, what's it to you? And he said, well, that shouldn't be done, blah, blah, blah. And, uh, you should 
you should get a Porsche dealer. You should, you should have a Porsche dealer. You shouldn't be allowed to sell. Nobody should be allowed to sell Porsches except us. Um, so, you know, nothing ever came of it other than, you know, they kept me from making about a half a million dollars on flipping GT3 RSs. When Porsche said that I shouldn't be flipping cars, I said, well, I'm just fixing a problem that you guys created. You guys got your pricing and your regional distribution wrong. If you raise your prices and send all your cars to, you know, LA, Miami, all that, then I wouldn't exist. I'm, you know, I'm just taking advantage of an opportunity. But they have to satisfy their dealers and, you know, placate them and say, well, you sold so many Cayennes, you get a GT3 RS. Um, so they haven't necessarily changed that, but what they've done is introduced stiff penalties to all these dealers saying, well, if you sell outside of your region, we're just gonna fine you $5,000. So it's all just punitive now. Um, or like in Porsche's case, they introduced the 918 VIP program where you have to buy a million dollar car and then you get first rights to any GT car. And if you sell that car within six months, you get booted out of the program. So of course guys just waited for six months and one day and then flipped them anyway. And all Porsche did was turn their best VIP customers into opportunists. So they took people like me out of the picture and just put other people into the picture. And uh, I mean, it's, it's supply and demand. There's, there's always going to be a way around the system. Just received a text from my brother that my father was shot nine times by the robbers. In, in the car business, certainly I avoid most scammers because they know better than to mess with the car dealer. They prey on unsuspecting private sellers on uh, places like Craigslist and Facebook Marketplace and all that, and they have any number of tricks. But every now and then they happen upon, maybe accidentally, uh, a car dealer selling a car such as me, and I decide to have a little fun with them. Now, Ed and I had actually uh, tried multiple times to bait a scammer in order to uh, really for our own entertainment value but of course for for the purpose of a story and neither of us had any success because it seems like scammers are using the same tricks their tricks haven't changed but people are just getting dumber um, you'd think that uh, people would figure out the tricks that scammers are using and not fall prey to them but 10 years ago it seems they were actually using much more advanced means to try to scam people. And you could uh, even talk to some of them on the phone. And now apparently it's so easy to scam people that they only go for the low hanging fruit. So as soon as you show any sign of intelligence um, whatsoever, they just uh, ghost you and, and they move on to the next uh, easy prey. Well, I had a super WRX race car on racing junk of all places. And I got the typical text message that was pretty obviously a scammer, very cordial, but broken English and uh, an eager willingness to buy my car at the agreed upon price without any negotiation whatsoever. That's a dead giveaway that it's a scammer. They are most definitely not shrewd negotiators. So of course they start out with texting from one number and then somebody else texts from a different number. Now, uh, this may be slightly offensive to some people, and I am in no means condoning um, the actions of the fake name that I took on, but it has a backstory. My friend Ryan from Maine created a fake Facebook profile under this name because he thought it was hilarious and Facebook actually took it, but uh, it was Jiffy T. Herapist, which could be deemed Jiffy Therapist, but it's really... The space is in a different place. We'll just leave it at that. Uh, my brain was not functioning fully the day that I decided to mess with the scammer. And the first fake name I could come up with was Ben Dover. And that was way too fifth grade. So I settled on Jiffy T. Herapist. So he texts me, hello, Jiffy T. Herapist. This is Kent Leland. I'm the one buying your Subaru WRX, blah, 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 blah. And a, a typical scammer, they said, well, I'll send you more money than you're asking 
because it needs to cover the shipper's fund. You'll send the money to the shipper's agent. They send you a fake cashier's check. You deposit it before you have time for the bank to find out that it's not real. You send them back a cashier's check to their shipper's agent, and then you're screwed. So I said, okay, sure, here's my address. Go ahead, send the check. Let's see where this goes. So I asked him for his address and details for the title paperwork, and he sends me a passport photo. Now, this will come into play later. Of course, a passport photo doesn't show his address. Smart. So, you know, my shipping agent will contact you for the pickup. The price is $36,980, as I had it advertised. My uh, shrewd negotiation kicked in, and I said, well, I really want $40,000 because I have some other parties interested. You know, I, I put a lot of money into this car. Okay, yep, no problem, sure. I probably could have told him 80 and he would have gone for it as long as he can pay me more than he agreed upon. So of course he goes, nope, okay, no problem and the fund will cover your payment and also the shipment fees. I'm in no rush with you till the check is cleared. That's nice of him. You are required to deduct the money for your item and send the rest balance to the mover for him to be able to offset shipping and other tax charges. So he sends me a tracking number, said it was delivered to Wilmington, Delaware. I said, well, I'm not in Wilmington, Delaware. A couple days later, it shows up. So I'm still kind of figuring out the plan here. So I've got to buy some time with him. So I leave the check on my desk for a number of days and don't really do anything with it. And of course, some people could say, well, contact the FBI, contact the bank that it was drawn on, you know, all these different things. I'm like, they're not going to be able to do a thing. There's so much of this going on. He's in another country. I'm just going to have some fun with it and, and let it be. Now, he had sent me uh, 42980 So 2980 was to cover the shipping. So I, of course, sent him back a message and said, well, it seems like you're getting overcharged for your shipping. How about I just have my transporter send you the car? I'll just put the title in the glove box and sign it off. Now, I would never do things like that. You never let a trucker have a signed title. Goodness gracious. But, you know, for the sake of the story, I was willing to do just about anything. And I was ready to have one of my transporters just, you know, pretend to load it up. I'd take a video of it, send it to him, all that sort of stuff, and send him a copy of the title. But he didn't go for that. He knew better than to give me an address. So he said, no, 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 just, just send the money to the shipper. It's already been booked with them. I'm like, okay, well, had to try. Probably a few days go by and he keeps asking if I've deposited the check and I'm still figuring out what exactly I'm going to do with this. And I said, yep, 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 funds should be cleared in a couple days. Kept offering the shipping, uh, my own shipping. He said, well, my trucker can also take all the spare parts. Um, he can load the car this weekend. He'll go anywhere in the USA. You know, it's, it's, it's on the house. Still didn't go with it. He had given me no address whatsoever. The only thing I had was his passport and the name. Now, the, the, the check came, interestingly enough, from a different name. So he told me his name was Kent Leland. The return name on the package was uh, Matthew Hill in an address in Iowa, which came back to a uh, discount grocery store. And the remitter on the check was Otis Henson. So we have three completely different names involved here. And uh, in order to continue to have fun with this guy, I decided to not call him out on any of the apparent discrepancies. Did not want to give him any indication whatsoever that I thought or knew that he was completely full of crap. So of course, he, uh, he asks me to purchase a USPS cashier's check. So I didn't know the post office sold cashier's checks, but yeah, no matter. And then he sends me the name and address to send this to his shipping agent. And it was Vincent Leonard McDaniel, 232 South 12th Avenue, Phoenix, Arizona. So I said, okay, well, I'm gonna see who this guy is and where that address goes to. So I Googled the address and it came up to, um, on Google Maps, it came up to a homeless shelter. But then on the actual address came up to a couple of businesses. So I called the numbers on the businesses, both of them came back, you know, the number not in service, tried to look up everything I could about them. They were closed or defunct or non-existent. So I said, well, this is kind of weird. I called the homeless shelter. I said, hey, can you tell me if this uh, Vincent McDaniel guy is there? And they said, no, HIPAA rules, we can't disclose any of that. I said, okay, well, I show you at 230 South 12th Avenue, what is 232, is that affiliated with you guys oh yeah yeah that's our that's our welcome center that's where we receive mail it's like 
perfect. So if I send something to this Vincent guy at that address, it'll get to him. Yep. Now, back to the passport. About halfway through this process, I decided to Google the name on the passport. Not sure why I didn't think of that sooner. So I Googled Kent Leland and came back with a pretty interesting result. One of the first results was this article about uh, armed mercenaries arrested in Haiti. And I was like, ooh, maybe I shouldn't be messing with this guy. <laughs> uh, hmm, good thing I carry a gun, but this guy sounds a lot more serious than that. This Kent guy, I guess, was an ex-Marine and was down in Haiti running some secret mission. Nobody knew why he was there and was arrested with a whole nother crew of armed mercenaries. So I started to get a little nervous, but then realized when I did more digging that uh, Mr. Leland actually ran a private security company and he was down there on a, a mission to protect somebody that he was hired to do. And the US government actually brought him back and just said, sorry about the hassle you know, welcome home. And when he got arrested and the news broke, the passport photos of all the parties involved were posted online. So of course they went to Twitter and Mr. Otis Henson or whoever the scammer actually was just kiped the passport photo and decided to use that as his identification for scamming. So thankfully I was not dealing with an ex-Marine armed mercenary who was scamming people Nigerian style on the side. All this time I'm delaying and delaying and I didn't have an excuse as to why I hadn't deposited the check, but I knew that once I did deposit the check, I only had a few days to mess with him because he knew that it would come back as bad. So he starts getting real pushy. The funny thing is every time he texted me, it was, hello, Jiffy. Good morning, Jiffy. I couldn't have picked a better name. I ignored a, a few of his messages. So he goes, after all, have been friendly with you all through this transaction and you know it yourself. So I see no reason why you should be playing on my intelligence. You got me mad, honestly. Courtesy demands you should at least acknowledge my message and let me know what is going on. You made me feel as if I am dealing to some kind of ghost or something. I am sorry if I sound nasty, but it's not fair. Thanks. So... I said, yep, sorry, I'm out racing. I'm sure you can understand that as you're buying a race car, you know, and you're welcome to send a shipper anytime. I can pay that, them at time of pickup, or if you give me their company info, I can call with a credit card. He didn't take the bait on that one either. He just kept going back to, nope, shipper will only come after you've paid him, send a cashier's check. Then I said, I, I, my office manager forgot to deposit the check. I'm, I'm really, really sorry. I thought it was done already, so I'll make sure it happens. And I sent him a picture of the check, me holding the check in front of the, the car he was buying. So um, just continually trying to make him think that I really thought this was a legit deal. So that bought me a few more days. So it started to get pretty good. I then had to figure out how, how I was going to mess with this guy. And a lot of people thought that, well, I should get this guy Vincent arrested or, or try to do that. Well, he's a scammer. I'm like, no, the, the scammer's in, you know, Alberia somewhere. And uh, he's using all these people in different places and, and paying them a little bit to, to be his agents. So I said, that's, that's not going to do any good because even if they do get arrested, they have such a small part and they're working for an unknown party that, you know, they won't be able to pin anything on them. But at, at one point, I actually thought about sending Vincent a fake cashier's check because I had read that somebody had gotten arrested at the bank trying to deposit a cashier's check that had been sent to them by a scammer. And they immediately detected it as fake, called the police and they got arrested. So I was like, hmm, maybe this is a ploy to get him arrested. And that will then, you know, maybe trickle back up, they'll investigate it, whatever. The problem is, is I don't know enough nefarious characters to actually get a fake cashier's check made. I called everybody I knew and nobody knew. And everybody was like, well, why do you want one? What, what are you up to? Yeah, so I, I didn't even actually, couldn't have gotten one done if I had tried. So I thought, okay, we got to come up with a better solution. So I called uh, Ed Bolian, king of messing with scammers and threatening truckers. He said, let's do a giant check and have it delivered. I said, okay, well, that might prove to be a little difficult, but sure, let's go for it. So I contracted a company in Phoenix to make up a, a giant four-foot check payable to Vincent Leonard McDaniels from Otis Henson. So when he got it, he might at least make the connection, know that jig was up. 
and uh, we made it payable from Vinwiki Bank and Trust and had it printed up overnight and had a guy lined up in, in Scottsdale to go deliver the check with a video camera. Now, in the meantime, as a backup plan, I had to keep uh, Mr. Kent happy. And I went to my bank and got an actual cashier's check, took a picture of it, and then immediately redeposited it. But then I sent him the picture and said, here you go. Here's the check I'm sending you on Monday. And I said, but here's the thing. I need Vincent to be available at 1030 on Wednesday because it's you know direct signature required. Can you please make sure your shipper's agent is going to be there? So he said, yeah, 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 sure. Not sure how seriously he took that. So I, I knew I had to send him an actual package and I got to put something in the package. So I'm like, all right, well, as a backup plan, in case this giant check thing doesn't work, because there's a lot of variables and moving parts, I'm going to fill it with Monopoly money, thousands of dollars worth, and also, Kind of in an ironic twist, I put in a Bible tract entitled The Story. Sent that out, sent him the tracking number. Of course, this is where scammers just get greedy. After I had told him that I had sent the cashier's check, he got so greedy that he thought he had, you know, he he thought he had a, a, a fish on the line that he wasn't just content with the $2,900. He wanted all of his money back. So I get this message. Hello, Jiffy T. Herapist. I'm sad to notify you at this point. On my way driving out of town, just received a text from my brother that my father was shot nine times by the robbers. My brother said he is in coma right now. We need to cancel the deal for now and accept the offer, please. This is based on the fact that my brother that called said I need to raise some fun for the treatment or else we will lose our father. My brother proclaims that health is a person's greatest wealth. He must be related to Joel Osteen, which I also believed. I will need you to send me so money right away, please, as to save my father's life as I am not around for now. Thanks for your quick response shall be appreciated. So I said, okay, well, to what address should I send this check? Well, is there Bank of America close to you? No, sorry, no Bank of America. But if you give me your account info, I can give you a wire transfer because I figure, well, at least with that, I can... You know, maybe I'll print some fake checks using his bank account or something. And of course, he sent me his wire information and it was a bank in Canada registered to an LLC. So again, nice veil covering him. So I couldn't really do anything with that. I had to backpedal a little and, and, and restart the cog in the brain. So I said, well, I'm in a tough spot here. I thought my race car was sold. And so my wife already spent a bunch of the money on a down payment for remodeling and getting a purebred cat that's some exotic breed. You can really see that happening. I wasn't expecting you to need the money back. I discussed it with her tonight over dinner, and things are not comfortable at the Herapist household tonight. Jiffy is not getting spiffy if you get my drifty. So he responds, Hello, and very so for the late response. I understand how you feel, and I'm sorry for putting you in this condition. I don't intend to collect the fund back, but is due to my father condition. Let me know you agreed on and get back to me. Thanks. Side note, I was keeping my wife informed of all of this. So now, of course, if we come home after dinner or something, if, if I'm in, uh, intending on feeling frisky with her later on in the night, I will say something to the effect of Jiffy wants to get a stiffy to which she just rolls her eyes. <laughs> He says, uh, get back to me, thanks. I'll be glad if you can save my father life, thanks. He said, I really want to help. My wife will not allow me to send the money back to you as she has already spent most of it thinking this was a done deal. The only way I can return your money is to go take out a loan against the car which my bank will give me for the value. Here we go. I'm trying the Nigerian scammer trick back at him. And I said, there's a $200 application fee. My wife handles the finances and she will not allow me to get this loan if she knows about it. But if you can send me the funds for this application fee to my phone using Zelle or Western Union, she will not know about it. Please help me help you and we can get this done so my marriage is still okay and she doesn't know and then your father can get the treatment he needs. And he said, hello, Jiffy, just get the 200. I'm running out of cash right now. The only hope I have is the money in your hand. Please just help with any amount you have now. Thanks.
So, man, I could have sent him $1,000 and kept my car. So I offered to send him the title to the Subaru so he could go get a title loan on it. And just about then, the jig was up because he uh, got a message from Vincent. And he goes, hello, Jiffy. I just spoke to Vincent. He said the package you sent was Monopoly money and a storybook about God. I don't understand what is going on. Can you please explain to me? Thanks. This guy is the thickest scammer I think I've ever dealt with. What's going on is that you're an idiot and I gotcha. So I asked him if he got the check. And I'm like, the, the check was delivered via courier. He's like, no, no, no. We just got this Monopoly money. I'm like, no, no, no. There was a check left at the Welcome Center. Did he get it? Now, unfortunately, when the guys went to deliver the check, they had got a call on a job earlier, so they couldn't be there at 1030 as agreed upon. So I was glad I had the backup plan. So they went in the afternoon after the mail center was closed and Vincent was nowhere to be found. But I guess they had some interesting experiences walking in because there was a big tent city all around the homeless shelter and they were getting some uh, interesting, I don't know, cat calls or something uh, over the check from some of the homeless guys. And one guy is like, oh man, that's a big check. I need a couple more zeros on it for me. He's like, you want me to come in and help you there? You know, I, I can raise some ruckus if you need it. So they, they had quite the interesting time. And although the check didn't get delivered and we didn't get the, the big payoff, we at least got some, some good feedback from the scammer. So then he says, Jiffy, please, I don't want you to play on my intelligence. Well, too late for that. The shipping agent said, you sent storybook and a monopoly money, not a check. Be sincere, please. Can you send me a proof that what you send was check, not a story, please, because this thing is very serious. So I said, well, you know, I'll, I'll call you. Let's let's talk about this. Can I call you this afternoon? Hello, my cell phone fell down a few nights ago, so you can only hear me. I won't be able to hear from you. I can only reply your text. Please bear with me. So, of course, you know, no contact. I was going to have my buddy from the FBI call him, but uh, didn't work. So as one last ditch effort, I said, all right, I, I got to get a picture of Vincent with the check. So I texted him. I'm like, listen, I know what's up. You're a scammer. You suck. I said, but you've been messing with, with the wrong guy. I have all your information. I've done all this research, like all this time I've bought. I know who you are. I'm like, all your information is going to be released to Interpol unless you send me a picture of Vincent with the check giving a thumbs up. Easiest ransom ever, right? Like, I'm not making you send me money. I've tried that. Didn't work. Just send me a friggin' picture. Nope. Didn't care. Just uh, do what you have to do. Okay. And he, he acted still confused. Like he goes, are you treating me or what Vincent said? He did not received any check from you. The only thing he received was storybook and monopoly money. I'm like, you still don't get it. You still don't get it. I know you're scamming me. Anyway, it 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 uh, just kind of died there. And unfortunately, we don't have a, a wonderful picture or video of Vincent receiving the giant check. But uh, somewhere down in a homeless shelter in Phoenix, there's thousands of dollars of Monopoly money and a giant check floating around. This is the Columbus Police Department. We're about to tow your Lamborghini. So not only have I had a string of run-ins with the cops, I've also had a few close encounters and not so close encounters with getting some pretty fantastic cars towed. One of the first ones was a 1973 Porsche 911S. And I had been storing this car for a customer and he asked me to come meet him for lunch and to bring the car. And he said, you know, need some exercise, you know, go for it. Uh, he said, oh, you know, check the, check the plate, you know, I make sure it's registered before you leave. And I looked at the date and I said, 513. I said, okay, it's April, April's four, we're good. And I thought to take a dealer tag with me, but just didn't. So I'm driving, I'm on my way there. A cop starts following me. He pulls me over. Like, okay, you know, your registration's expired. I'm like, no, it isn't. Cause yeah, it expired in May of last year. Oh, it's 2014. Sorry about that. And he goes, well, do you have your license and insurance card? I'm like, oh, I, you know, I couldn't find the guy's insurance card because again, it had been in storage with me forever. So he comes back what seemed like a half an hour later and he goes, well, we got another problem. This plate is not 
for this car. This is registered to a 2011 Mercedes. I said, I guess there's no way I can convince you that this is a 2011 Mercedes, huh? <laughs> he said, hey, I'm not gonna arrest you, but I have to tow your car. There's nothing I can do about that. All the time I'm on the phone with my customer, I said, you know, we're not gonna make lunch cause uh, you put the wrong plate on your car. Thanks for that, by the way. <laughs> Another time I was up in Elkhart Lake for the Road America Vintage Races. And I was staying with a friend and on, I think Saturday night, they have a car show, which is all the local cars, vintage cars, whatever that people have. And they shut down downtown and line the streets with these cars. They had asked him to bring his Viper ACR-X to the show. And an ACR-X, as you know, is a race version of the Viper ACR. No VIN, not street legal. But in Elkhart Lake during Vintage Weekend, you know, pretty much anything goes. So all the race cars from the track at a police escort, they come down and, and fill up the streets. So I didn't see any issue with driving a race car three quarters of a mile down to the show. And he asked me to take it for him because they had already started barbecuing and were a few beers deep and I hadn't had anything to drink. So he goes, hey, you want to take the car down to the show? Because I, I told him I'd take it. I'm like, yeah, no problem. Me and a friend hop in the car and go down to the show. And after like an hour, I look at her, I'm like, I really want steak. You want to go back to the party? The show is boring. Yeah, 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 let's, let's do that. So I hop in the car may or may not have done a, a nice burnout, you know, between the rows of cars. And this young whippersnapper cop on a bicycle, pedal bicycle, pulls up next to me. And I'm thinking, oh, that's nice. He's going to stop traffic for me and allow me to get out because that's the kinds of things that happen on Road America Vintage Weekend. No. Sir, is this car registered? Very simple question. Yes, was my answer. Yes. He goes, where's your plate? And here again, I'm thinking, I had a dealer plate with me. It would have been as simple as slapping it on the windshield and no questions would have been asked. So he goes, pull around the corner and I'm gonna check your, check your paperwork. I just look at my passenger. I'm like, we're screwed. And I hear his radio go off and he gets all flustered and he's just like, I, I gotta, I gotta go to this call. You just, you just go straight home. I was certainly relieved not to have to uh, call him and say his, his ACRX had been impounded. <laughs> Another time I was driving a 89 Countach anniversary down to Columbus for this exotic car rally where they shut down the roads and had a big police escort and overnight thing. It was actually quite comfortable driving on the highway obviously terrible trying to maneuver it around with an 800 pound clutch that uh, I think Jay Cutler would have a hard time pushing in and out. I notice my voltmeter is starting to creep down. And you know, I've been watching my gauges religiously because that's what you do with a Lamborghini. Even though I know what's wrong, I call my Italian tech and I say, hey, this is happening, what's wrong? And he goes, oh, your alternator's going bad. I'm like, okay, thanks, I knew that, but you know, nothing I can really do. Can't turn off the air conditioning because it's probably off anyway. Even if it was on, I wouldn't be able to tell in that car. So we make it to the finish party. So I let the cops know that, hey, I have to leave this car here. It's stranded. Um, no problem. We'll let the next shift know, you know, we'll, we'll take care of it. So the next day I said, okay, I called a friend. I said, hey, can you pick me up and can I borrow a car to go back to Cleveland? I'll get my enclosed trailer. I'll trailer your car back and then go get the Lamborghini. So he picks me up at my hotel. We're on our way back to his house. And I get a phone call from a 614 number. I'm like, I should probably pick this up. Mr. Tabbitt, this is the Columbus Police Department. We're about to tow your Lamborghini. Apparently the meters run on Saturdays and the cop from last night had not let anyone else know that this was the situation. So I had accumulated some parking tickets on the car, but thankfully the cop didn't want the liability of towing the Lamborghini. So she looked up my dealer plate and found my number and called me and said, listen, you need to come get the car. 
if we get a complaint call, we have to tow it. I'm like, okay, well, I'll be there as quickly as I can. Please don't tow it. Thank you very, very much. So I called Craig Reed over at Studio 47 and he was loading up, getting ready to go away for a race weekend. And he said, no problem, come on over. I've got my trailer hooked up, we'll go get it now. So we put the booster box on, starts right up fine. And I noticed the, the voltmeter's back up to 14. I'm like, that's kind of weird. So I said, you know, I'm just gonna try driving it back and see what happens and just follow me in case. It ended up making it back to the shop with no alternator issues. Turns out it was something that happens when they get hot. So he did end up rebuilding the alternator, but uh, thanks to Craig, I did not get the, the Lamborghini towed and impounded, which would have stunk because it was a super low mile anniversary Countach. Some friends of mine and I decided to go down and stay at the Hilton where the Gold Rush Rally was staying when they came through Cleveland. And we happened to follow a McLaren in that was probably the first person in from the rally. And so we pull up to the valet. I said, we're not on the rally or anything. We're just staying here for the night. He said, okay, we'll just follow that McLaren. That'll, you know, they'll tell you where to go. Watched all the cars come flying in, you know, took pictures, this and that, you know, then got a cab and went out on the town. We get back and I said, hey, let's go down into the parking garage and see all the cars that might have showed up after we left. So we wander down into the parking garage and the security guard goes, hey, you can't come in here. You don't have a wristband. I said, well, those are our cars right there. So he goes, oh, yeah, we've been looking for you. You're not part of the rally. You, you came under here under false pretenses and you pretended you were part of the rally and you're not supposed to be parked over here with these cars and you need to move it or we're gonna tow you. The people I was with were a little more hot-headed than I am, and they had a little alcohol to fuel that as well. So they started arguing with this guy. I was the only one reasonably sober, or within spitting distance of being sober, so I, I pulled my friends aside, and I'm just like, guys, guys, just hold on, calm down, just give me a minute. So I went to security card, and I said, listen, I know you're trying to do your job, we're guests of the hotel. I asked the valet where to park and he told us. We don't have stickers on our car, you can see that. But I said, none of us is in any position to move these cars. We've all been drinking, we're not moving the cars. I said, but it's not a great idea to tow us either because we're guests of the hotel. In the back of my mind, I wanted to be like, do you like your job? Because if you do, you're not gonna tow a couple Ferraris and a Porsche that are parked here that are guests of the hotel. You will not have a job in the morning. But I didn't say that. I was trying to appeal to his sense of power and, and his ego and all that. So he said, okay, all right, I'll let it slide, but uh, I, can't, I can't speak for the guy that comes in at seven in the morning. And I'm like, I, I, I can, he's not really gonna care. I'm, I guarantee you, he's just gonna be like, whoa, look at these cars, you know? So it ended up, everything was fine. And you know, <laughs> we came down in the morning, our cars were still there. A potentially really bad situation was diffused thanks to clearer heads prevailing. <laughs>
and she starts talking and telling me this whole backstory of why the car is for sale. Her brother had died a couple years ago and she had just come to grips with being able to sell the car and it just got more complicated from there. And the, the, the price was indeed, I won't say too good to be true, but it was a let's go down there with cash right now type of deal. So of course the alarm bells always go up when that's the case. But not only that, she just starts telling me all this backstory that I don't need to know. Oh, by the way, the, the title's in my sister's name. Is that okay? I'm like, I really don't care as long as she's there to sign it off and has proper identification, then that's fine. Oh, by the way, can you give me cash? Cause you know, we've had some tax issues with our business and this and that. I'm like, just, just, just stop talking. I'm like, yes, I can pay you cash. I'm buying a car from you. It's a legitimate transaction, but don't just, just stop this. I couldn't get there right away because I had to pick a customer up from the airport. So I'm just asking her, hey, please don't sell the car to somebody else. I, I will come down this afternoon with cash, but I, I can't leave now. I, I can't strand this guy at the airport who came in to buy a slant nose turbo Porsche. She goes, well, there's this other dealer that's calling and they're offering me a thousand dollars less, but you know, I don't, I don't necessarily want to take that, but they're bothering me. And I said, no, I'll, I'll give you the full amount. Just just hang on for me. And I'd finally get her off the phone. And then half an hour later, she called me again. And just every conversation, the deal got weirder and weirder. I heard a story actually in Ohio, somebody posting a job on Craigslist on their farm. And when people would go out to interview for the job, he had a rifle and he was sniping people, taking them out as they showed up. Buying cars off Craigslist or buying things off Craigslist is, can be hazardous to your health. I went back to the shop, got my trailer, went home, got my gun, and I called a friend of mine. So I said, hey, how far are you from Kent? He goes, oh, I'm five minutes. I'm like, great, stay there. I need you to follow me because I'm gonna go up to this address and if anything's off, I need, you know, I need somebody else to be there. So I pull down the address and look in, the garage is open. Sure enough, there's a 2003 anniversary Corvette convertible in there. And I'm like, well, the car's real. <laughs> totally legit. The car's there. Her sister shows up with the title. I had called the title bureau, ran, ran the title number, confirmed everything was on the up and up and all that. But the adventure had just gotten started. <laughs> We go to the local PNC bank, which was not my usual branch, not necessarily the best municipality in Ohio. So we go to the bank and I go in and I go up to the counter and I said, hi, I'd like $31,000 in cash. And the lady there was a little bit off put, but okay, let's, let's see what we can do. So I had done a wire transfer in earlier that day for this purchase. Well, the bank who had sent the wire transfer was taking their sweet time, hadn't put it in, so uh, the money wasn't there yet. So that held them up for a while. And after making phone calls, it still wasn't there. I said, forget this. I'm just going to do a direct transfer from my personal account, which I just did on my phone. So I went back up to the counter. I said, hey, I just did the transfer. The money's there. So they go to the back office, you know, hushed conversations, guys on the phone. And I'm, you know, sitting in the lobby with this lady. So it's, you know, a little bit uncomfortable. And after, I don't know, 20 minutes or so, they come out and, oh, we're on the phone with our loss prevention something or other specialist. And I said, why? It's, it's my money. Oh, I know, but we just have to make sure we're protecting everybody and like, but it's, it's my money. Just give me my money. You know, I know you're a bank and you have to protect your interests, but let me take this risk. I'm pretty sure I know what I'm doing. After a while, they just said, Hey, you know, we can't give you the cash for whatever reason. And I said, okay, well, how about a cashier's check? That's perfectly fine. It's, it's the same. The lady was agreeable to that. Well, we can't issue a cashier's check unless we have enough cash in the branch to back it. I'm like, that's a new one. I haven't heard this one before, but the lady finally comes out and she goes, Mr. Tabbitt, 
I think your Twinsburg branch can better assist you. And I'm like, are you like, are you telling me no? Or what is, I think your Twinsburg branch can better assist you. I'm like, okay, I'm getting kicked out of this bank. Awesome. <laughs> On the way out, they hand me this flyer that is all about like money laundering and drug trafficking and how to know if you're involved in all this. And I'm like, are you serious? <laughs> are you serious right now? And like she had even brought in the title to the vehicle and all that. So it was like, you know, there shouldn't be any suspicion, but because it was Ravenna, Ohio, this was not a normal thing for them. Of course, I'm super embarrassed because I'm trying to buy this car and, you know, not able to get my money to do it. So I apologized. I said, hey, you know, I'll be back in an hour. I'm going to run up to my usual PNC branch and, and get this thing taken care of. And of course, you know, they close at four. So we're, we're on the clock now. And I've got my trailer in tow still. So I call Twinsburg and say, hey, I'm, I'm on my way. I need cash. So I boogie up there and they have it all ready and counted out, you know? And so I walk in and they go, so how would you like it? You want a briefcase or, you know, <laughs> like it became this big joke there. So they, they counted out the cash and thankfully I still had my piece on me. So I wasn't too worried about carrying around a, a whole bunch of cash. So I went back, I loaded the, the Corvette onto my trailer and got it back to my warehouse and you know, it's funny because I, I unload it, I put it in my warehouse and I just stand there and look at it. And this ordeal started at like nine that morning when I had gotten the email and it was probably six o'clock by the time I got it in my warehouse. And I'm just standing there and I'm like, I never actually thought this car existed, let alone that I got it back. And I'm just kind of reveling in the fact that I'm like, the car is real and it's in my warehouse. <laughs> Every now and then a deal that's too good to be true isn't. But the only problem with that is the hope of that is, is what keeps people getting scammed over and over again, because everybody's looking for that deal. The problem is, is they're not always as easy as they seem. I think I sold it for 36 and I actually sold it to a retired local police chief as cherry as cherry gets. Kind of the neatest part of the deal for me is she had a set of really nice HRE wheels on it, but she had the magnesium wheels in the basement. And of course, on a 1200 mile anniversary Corvette, HRE wheels don't add any value. They actually detract it. I put the magnesium wheels on the car, kept the HRE wheels, and now I have a spare set of HREs for my vet. Yeah, just a couple dead hookers in the trunk. I had a Honda S2000. I was going to a wedding in downtown Cleveland and I'm going to turn left into this parking garage. I'm like, I don't want to do a three point turn. I'm just gonna, you know, do my thing, kick the tail out, show off a little bit. And I, you know, check my mirrors, look around, no cops. So I drop the clutch, spin the car around, perfectly executed drift, just, you know, kick the tail out towards the people. And as I'm coming back around full lock, I see a motorcycle cop and I'm just staring him in the face. I'm like, crap. So I you know, reel it back in nicely and pull over and he pulls up behind me. What do you think you were doing there? Well, officer, you see those people that are telling me that I had to turn around and go around there and I didn't want to you know, blah, blah, blah. And so I just, uh, you know, the the clutch slipped. Yeah, right. My like, crap, he's not buying it. And up to this point, I had a streak. I think I had been pulled over 10 times without a ticket. And I'm just going, man, that, there goes my streak. I, th no way I can get out of this one. I'm in the middle of the city, like 15 people saw it, you know. Me being the arrogant person I am and just having extreme luck, at some point I just got this feeling. I'm like, I'm getting out of this. I don't know how or why, but I'm getting out of it. So of course I lost any humility or sense of, you know, deference I had toward the cop and went into sarcastic mode. So he comes back, comes up to my window 
He goes, well, I guess it must be your lucky day. And I look at him and just go, why, officer? You know, on the verge of laughing. And he holds up his ticket book and he goes, I'm out of tickets. You would think that I would thank him and, and move on. No. Without missing a beat, I looked right back at him and said, I guess you'll just have to mail me one then. He firms up, maybe I will, and storms back to his bike. So I got pulled over at three in the morning in my Corvette and uh, going way too fast. And the cop comes up and go through the whole thing. You know, I have a CCW, I put my hands on the wheel, you know, my gun's in the center console. Okay, well, you know, license and insurance, please. I'm like, well, officer, the funny thing is my insurance is underneath my gun, which is in the center console, so what should I do? Just take it out carefully, put it on the passenger seat. Okay, no big deal, follow his instructions. Well, it's a small town in Ohio. Another cop comes because it's three in the morning. They got nothing to do. Apparently, they didn't communicate. So the other cop comes to the passenger window and I just see him going, gun, there's a, there's a gun, there's, there's a gun. <laughs> and the, the other cop's like, hey, hey, I got it. We're, we're good, you know. And uh, so I did end up getting a ticket for that one. Um, but after I got the ticket, I said, you know, officer, the speed limit shouldn't apply after midnight. I mean, there, there just shouldn't be a speed limit. And he didn't really buy that, but I already had my ticket, so whatever. So for the brief amount of time that I attended college, I won't say studied because I didn't do any of that. I let it be known that I had been to stunt driving school, among other things. So this fraternity called me up one night and they said, hey, will you take us out and show us how to do some stunt driving? I'm like, yeah, but I don't have a car. No problem, we borrowed one of the guy's parents' cars. I'm like, are they okay with it? Yeah, 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 they're, they're fine with it. We told them what we're doing, all that. I'm like, okay, let's do it. So we went out to some parking lot uh, behind a supermarket and I started showing him how to do J turns and 180 slides and slide into a parking space and you know all sorts of stuff like that. I'm pretty sure it had the foot pedal um, e-brake, but I had actually gotten really used to doing that because when I was in high school, before my parents bought the Crown Vic, they had a tourist station wagon with a foot pedal e-brake and we would go out and do ridiculous things. So I had gotten really, really good at um, drifting one-handed and and what i'd have to do is i'd hold the release with my left hand and if i wanted to slide through a corner i'd be modulating the e-brake while hold you know you have to hold it down here so i'm you know doing this i i don't know how but i got really good at the the foot pedal e-brake and uh we're having fun and i, I I neglected my rule of like, you know, you do something for like 10 or 15 minutes and then you find another spot. So I'm coming back across the parking lot and I see uh, parking lights. And I used to own a Crown Vic, so I know exactly what those parking lights look like. And I'm like, there's a Crown Vic following us across the parking lot with just their parking lights on. I'm like, dang it, we are so screwed. All of a sudden this blue lights light up and there, apparently there's one next to him with no lights on, his blue lights light up. And then around the corner of the supermarket, another cop comes with his lights going. This is not going to end well. I have to fly home for Thanksgiving tomorrow. I might not make it. One of the cops comes to our window, the other cop goes to the other window. And uh, you know we hear them laughing and joking around, but the cop wasn't having any of my nonsense, you know? And uh, so he's asking whose car it is. I'm like, well, it's that guy's parents, you know, this and that. And takes my driver's license. And um, he goes, well, what are you doing? I'm like, well, I'm a professionally trained stunt driver. And they asked me to teach them how to do these things and all that. And I, I think that threw him off because he's just expecting me to be like, oh, we're doing burnouts or we're racing or something. And uh, so he runs my license, he comes back and he starts doing the question thing where he's trying to trip me up. And he goes, well, if you're such a professional stunt driver, why don't you, you know, go practice at a racetrack? 
I'm like, officer, I never said I was a stunt driver, I said I, I'm professionally trained. Are you putting words in my mouth? I'm like, no, officer, I'm, I'm not. Sorry, you know, yes, I lied, you know, whatever. And so they're all huddling around one of the cars and we hear all the cops laughing and this and that. We're like, what the heck is going on? I mean, this was like a scene out of Super Troopers. The parents were like, oh yeah, yeah we know what they're up to. Just mess with them, we don't care, you know, give them a scare, arrest them, whatever, you know. So they're just like joking around with the cops. And that ended up saving us. Because after that whole thing, the cop comes back to my window. We're gonna let you go. You know, I, I could give you six points off your license, you know, for four different citations, but uh, we can't prove who was actually driving. And I'm like, well, I'm not gonna argue with you, but yes, you can, because you followed me across the parking lot and like, you knew I was driving. I'm sitting there just basking in the uh, glory of, I didn't get arrested uh, the night before I had to fly home. The cap on that story is I get back to my college dorm room, the guys let me out. And so I grab the rogue cones out of the trunk and walk back to my dorm. And as I'm walking back to my dorm, I feel this presence behind me. And it's this like campus security golf cart mobile thing. Where are you coming from? I'm like, ah, just out with friends, you know? What are those? I'm like, they're, they're my cones, you know, so what? It was, of course, late at night, so they assumed, oh, you're out stealing cones. Which, of course, I had stolen the cones earlier, but just not that night. They go through all the cones and this and that, and of course, one of them had to have, you know, property of Cleveland Heights or something like that. So they write me up and confiscate the cones and this and that. So, you know, I go upstairs and make sure I hide all the road signs that we had also stolen and transferred them to somebody else's dorm. So in case they came back, probably the best one, I had my CB radio and the trucker gets on and says, you know, Hey, we got to bear with a, a victim at such and such mile marker. And it was, you know, eight miles ahead of me, I think it was. So I got on and I said, you know, anything in between, in between here and there, no, nope, you're all clear. So I'm like, all right, great. Hammered it. I mean, literally 10 seconds later, I had just put the throttle down, came over a crest and there was a cop coming the other way. Like I'm still accelerating. I was doing about 90 and it was a 70 mile an hour zone. So of course he comes through the median and comes after me, follows me for, you know, eight miles to make me nervous and then pulls me over. I watch cops a lot. And I had seen this episode where a cop pulled a guy over in Texas and he starts asking him routine questions, but then he tricks him with a question like, you know, do you have any dead bodies or do you have any drugs, something like that. And if the person kind of laughs, he, he realizes that they're not suspicious. I had always held that if you can make a cop laugh, you have a great chance of getting off of a ticket which is why for those people who have seen my driver's license is why my picture is like this on my license. So the cop is of course asking me, do I have anything suspicious, loads of cash, this and that. I go, yeah, just a couple dead hookers in the trunk. It worked, he laughed, but he then also asked to uh, search my car, <laughs> reasonable. So he, you know, rifled through my back of my car and, you know, making, sh making sure we do our job and, you know, you understand, right? I'm like, yeah, sure. Just all the time waiting for the other shoe to drop. Oh, by the way, here's your ticket for 90 miles an hour. Never once mentioned my speed. Went back to his car, have a nice day. See you later. I've been accumulating FOP cards that I haven't used. And so I'm just driving faster and faster because I'm like, well, eventually I have to get pulled over and use these before they expire. Inevitably, they always ask, do you know why I pulled you over? And my smart aleck response would be, well, heck yeah, but if you don't, I'm not gonna tell you. <laughs> and the car in true Ferrari form went up in flames. Probably all of us have heard about the fantastic story of the Ferrari F50 getting jacked on a test drive from Algar Ferrari. 
and then being hidden in plain sight in Kentucky via a VIN swap, and finally getting apprehended by the FBI and being wrecked by a careless FBI agent. So of course that's one of the fantastic stories, but we know that scams happen on a regular daily basis, and if we do any searching on Craigslist or eBay, we come across them ourselves. Of course, there's always the fake cashier's check warnings and the people who want to send you too much money and then you refund them for the shipping and things like that, or people that want them to send you a $500 deposit for a deal that's too good to be true. But I've got a collection of a number of pretty incredible stories that will make you probably never want to get into the car business or at least never try to buy a car from somebody you don't know again. Uh, I believe this was actually my first client when I opened up Switch Cars after I left the Land Rover dealer and he had hired me to find him a Range Rover. So we were looking around for pre-owned ones that were a, a decent deal but a good car and he was also looking and he found this one on eBay. An aggressive deal but not too good to be true. If retail was about fifty-seven to 60000 at the time, I think this one was fifty-five grand. buy it now. And he had great pictures and VIN number and he had a phone number where you could actually call and talk to him. And he wasn't speaking in broken English, could actually put sentences together in his email responses. Everything seemed to be legitimate. The only somewhat red flag was that the car was in a warehouse in Texas and he was in Buffalo, New York, which isn't an immediate scam because, I mean, I've sold cars that are not in the same location that I am, but it's certainly a, a something to be cautious of. So my customer was ready to send this guy money and I noticed something was off and I called up my customer right away and I said, Mike, we got a problem. So if you look at the nav screen, that is from a 2004 because it's got the twisty buttons and he was advertising it as a 2005 which has the touchscreen navigation. I said that's that's not the right car. So I started doing a little more digging through his eBay profile and he had hundreds of positive feedback. So I went into the accounts that had left him feedback and I realized that all of their feedback for transactions were for penny transactions, recipes and things like that. And I started digging some more and realized that all of the ones below that were the same thing and they were basically just leaving each other feedback. So this guy had created hundreds, maybe thousands of eBay accounts to build up this large network of transactions and feedback to make himself look trustworthy. This guy went to the Rob Pitt School of eBay Manipulation and I contacted the FBI and let them know about this, but they were busy and didn't get back to me. But somebody, um, I think I may have posted the details online as well to warn people, and somebody contacted me a few weeks later and said, hey, we know you know about this guy, but I sent him a cashier's check and I'm out $55,000 and he's disappeared what can you do for me? And I'm like, nothing, like call the FBI, sorry. I mean, he's probably overseas by now, but next time call me first because I probably would have saved you the money. There was a gentleman in Ohio who had a penchant for buying black exotic cars with money that was not real. And he knew how to play the part. He was very personable. He had fancy watches, dressed well, and actually had some money and knew how to talk the game. So he would go into dealers and request a test drive. He would even negotiate and he would buy a car. And he got a Mercedes dealer with a SL and wrote them a check that was not good. And you would think, okay, well, why would somebody do this? And he really just did it for the fun of it. He lived locally and had a local driver's license, would purport that he was an attorney and so of course you know a dealer would take a personal check from a local guy who lived in an affluent neighborhood who was an attorney why wouldn't you you can always send the sheriff if the check isn't good and of course attorneys have greater consequences if they write checks which are not good but of course he was not a real attorney and the checks were written on an account that was not real he ended up walking into another local dealer who is a friendly competitor of mine and 
bought a black Ferrari 430 Spider. Proceeded to wreck it that night, unbeknownst to the dealer. He took it out and got high and drunk and T-boned somebody at an intersection. And the car, in true Ferrari form, went up in flames. So of course it got posted on wrecked exotics and stuff like that later on, but the dealer had no idea at the time. But they got a call from their bank the next day, which was a Saturday, that said, hey, there's something funny going on with this check. So he contacted them Monday when they had called him frantically saying, hey, this check is no good, and apologized profusely and said, I'm sorry, there was some error, and said, I'll, I'll wire you the money today. And oh, by the way, I'd like to buy the Ferrari California you have as well for my brother. And would you deliver it to the Justice Center downtown? Irony of all ironies. And they called the local police and said, hey, we have to deliver this other car. You want to set up a sting operation. So that's what they did. The cops followed them down. They parked outside the Justice Center with a Ferrari. And as soon as he got in the car, the cops swarmed and arrested him. My landlord at the time is a Hudson police officer. And she called me a few days later and said, hey, um, just want to let you know, sorry I didn't call you sooner, but we had this guy in prison and he recently got out. Um, we put him away last time for buying black exotic cars with fake checks. And he recently got released. So just wanted to let you know, because we know you sell exotic cars. I said, well, Thankfully, he didn't get me, but you're a few days too late because he just got one of my buddies. A uh, client contacted me looking to sell their 996 Porsche GT3, and they had it on consignment at a local dealer, Go Motors, out of Boulder, Colorado. The dealer would consign any car for a thousand dollar commission, which I thought was a little bit odd. You know, maybe if you're doing lower end Audis, which they did, that would be acceptable. But for a GT3, I just said, hey, listen, you can't survive making $1,000 on these types of cars. I did some more digging on this Go Motors and I found a lot of negative feedback kind of covered up under their positive reviews. Nothing scammy, just these guys aren't the, the most up and up guys. The gut check gave me indigestion. So I called the customer and said, listen, I'd prefer to just buy the car from you directly and, and cut out this dealer. Why don't you go get the car and the title from him and you know, I'll just tell him the deal's off. So he did and I ended up wiring money to the customer directly, which one would think is the less safe way to do things. I'm wiring money to some individual who I don't know with whom I have no recourse. But it turns out that was the best course of action Maybe a month later, it came out that the owner of Go Motors was indicted for fraud. He was selling cars on consignment, taking the money, and not paying the consigners. And unfortunately, the consigners are always out the money because they have really no recourse through the courts uh, with these companies who file bankruptcy and the money's gone overseas already. And even if they get a court injunction to seize the car, case law states that the person who bought the car bought it on good faith and the law typically protects the person who bought the car and the consignment dealership. You know, I wouldn't have gotten screwed on that because I would have received the title in the car, but I saved my customer from being out the money. And of course he was very grateful and we've done business since then as well. And I think I've sold that GT3 a couple more times since then. So then of course there's always the overseas buyers who like sending fake checks and usually I don't entertain these guys but I figured I'd have fun with one of them and he had emailed me about a Diablo SV and some other car and asked me what my best price was and a couple months later he got back to me saying he wanted to buy the car and I think both of them were sold at that point but I just I'm gonna mess with him he's a scammer so why not so I tell him to FedEx me a check and he does from Nigeria or somewhere over there but it was a check drawn on a US account from a company in Wisconsin. And I looked up the company, they're a large industrial company. I looked at the signatures on the check and they were printed, which is legitimate. Some companies will not sign their checks actually, but I'm like, this is, I mean, I knew it was a scam. So I was just having fun with him at this point. So I called up the company in Wisconsin 
and I deciphered the name that was one of the signatures and I asked for that person. And turns out they actually worked there. They were the controller at the company. And I said, hey, just so you know, you know, somebody over in Africa is writing checks on your company's behalf to buy some cars. And I'm sure you may be aware of this or may not be, but I want to let you know. So I messed with him a little more and said, hey, the check is for the wrong amount. You know, please send me another one and just want to see how much money I can make him spend spend on international overnight packages, but <laughs> he probably wasn't paying those bills either. But in spite of all my caution and experience, I did get scammed once. And I guess I'm not ashamed to admit it because it was a pretty good scam. It was back when the Nissan GTRs were still being pre-ordered. And of course I had a, a number of them at sticker price, which I then sold for a hefty profit. This guy contacted me out of the blue and said, I have an allocation that I want to, you know, move on and it's at sticker and I just need you to reimburse me for my deposit amount. Now you might say, well, why would somebody give up an allocation at sticker as did I, but that actually happens. So this one seemed legitimate. He faxed me the contract that he had with the dealer and the order spec and confirmation of order and everything checked out. His only request was, hey, please don't call the dealer because I don't want to you know, get in hot water and have them pull the allocation because they know I'm flipping it, which was a legitimate request. I mean, when I was flipping Porsches, I obviously didn't want the customers calling up the dealer saying, hey, I just bought your allocation for 50 grand over sticker from Doug because that would have immediately annoyed them and they would have found reason to pull the allocation other than the reasons they did anyway. I sent him the $5,000 and checked in with him every few weeks. And the only red flag I got was he seemed to not really remember who I was when I called, but I just chalked that up to scatterbrained or whatever. And you know, I'd send him the money. So what could I do at this point, but just to keep checking in. And I was on the golf course having a somewhat enjoyable day. And I got a call from a attorney general or some sort of detective or something like that in Iowa and said, Hey, did you send him some money? I said, yes, let me guess. I'm not getting it back. <laughs> and he said that was the case. And I was pretty bummed. It definitely uh, ruined a nice day on the golf course. And I also thought later that it would be an even better scam if the detective who called me wasn't a real detective, but he was somebody hired by this guy to call everybody so that they would feel at ease that, oh, well, it's being investigated and there's nothing else I can do and therefore not take any legal action. biggest chick magnet I ever had was an ex-cop car. My parents, I, I don't want to say they're gullible, but they were in Amway and they did buy colloidal silver and the Dale Alexander's cod liver oil. So, you know, maybe they were a little bit. I played upon that and convinced them they needed to buy a decommissioned Crown Victoria police interceptor so that I could practice what I had learned at Skip Barber. So we bought, uh, it was an Irvine Police Department unit number 24, and it still had the two spotlights on the front. And of course it was white with a black grill and all that. We proceeded to add a couple antennas, one of them just dummy, the other one for the CB and I install the PA in it. You know, perfectly legal. Nothing, no blue lights, no strobes, no sirens. I just happened to have a white Crown Vic that sort of looked like a cop car. The county detective cars up in Maine happened to also be white Crown Vics that basically looked exactly like mine. The advantage was driving on the highway, I could fly down the left lane with no consequences. Everybody would get out of my way. The disadvantage was we lived in a small town, two lane roads, you get behind people, you went the speed limit everywhere. Girls loved it. You could say almost anything through the PA and they would think it's hilarious. 
I drive Ferraris, Porsches, all sorts of stuff like that. People, people are like, oh man, those must get all the girls. No man, the, the biggest chick magnet I ever had was an ex-cop car. I had to, of course, buy the aviators. And I also went on eBay and bought myself one of these. So if you can imagine an 18 year old kid driving around a white Crown Vic with a couple antennas in this, but we were driving down a, a four lane road and somebody's coming the other way. And as they pass, I just rip the e-brake and just spin it around right behind them, slam on their brakes, move over into the right lane. I follow them for like half a mile and then just drive past them. I mean, we, we were terrible, terrible. It was so much fun. Um, also, the fun thing to do on the highway, on a three lane highway, is what I would do is I just park in the middle lane and I go exactly the speed limit. And I just watch piles of cars, two mile long lines behind me. I was driving through New York one time and in New York, it's illegal talk on your cell phone while you're driving, automatic ticket. Um, it's also technically illegal to have the word police on your car. So the little police interceptor badge on the back is technically illegal in New York. So I got main plates on it. I was talking on my cell phone with this hand, or no, I, I think I, I had it on my shoulder and I was eating ice cream with both hands, driving with my knee. A state trooper pulls up beside me and I look over, I'm like, mm, this isn't good. He looks over and keeps driving. I'm like, man, this is awesome. I can do anything. So the PA was the most fun ever. Bad boys, bad boys, what you gonna do? What you gonna do when they come for you? As we drive up and down the street, people just look at us, it's just so confused. I mean, that was really our aim, is just to confuse people. It, it was a lot of fun. I went to visit my friend and he goes, hey, and this was in high school. So one of his friends was having a party at his house. Uh, his parents were away, so I mean, all minors, tons of booze, all that. He's like, let's go bust the party. So I get on my, my trusty hat and aviators. We all pile into, the, uh, pile into the Crown Vic. And the best part was, as we're turning down the, the street, somebody behind us was going to the party. So they called people at the party. They go, guys, cops are on their way. Took the spotlights and we're, you know, doing this. And I get on the PA, 100% volume. Kip Farron, come out of the house. Kip Farron, come out of the house now with your hands in the air. So we're waiting and waiting. And a couple minutes later, he walks, he walks out of the house you know, like this, he's coming out of the front lawn. And, and I couldn't, you know, I couldn't contain myself any longer. I just start laughing into the PA, you know? And so he sees it's, it's us and he comes over the driver's side and just drags me out of the car and starts hugging me. Cause he's so relieved that he wasn't actually getting busted. And he's like, oh my gosh, dude, we were, we were chucking beer in the woods and like flushing stuff down the toilet and you know, this and that. He's like, holy crap, that was so awesome. We could see this pickup truck parked face out to the entrance of this gravel pit. So my buddy goes, hey, that's my cousin. He, he just got out of jail. He's on probation. I bet you any amount of money that he's back there smoking weed with an underage girl. So we, you know, e-brake come to a sliding stop facing him, you know, and you just see him just get wide-eyed. So I, you know, get on the PA, same thing, tell him to get out of the truck, you know, put his hands on the truck and all that. And, and of course, sure enough, in the passenger seat was this like about 14 year old girl. And so he's sitting there with his hands on the truck, just freaking out. And of course, after messing with him for a couple minutes, we told him, we're like, dude, we're just messing with you and, and all that. It was, it was just great fun. For being an 18 year old with a Crown Vic that looked like a cop car, I'd like to say I had a lot of self-control. They decided to donate it to some local missionaries after I moved to college. So now it's on a mission from God. 
We'd like to thank Dream Car Exchange for supporting the VinWiki YouTube channel this month. DCX is an enthusiast marketplace with auctions for amazing cars happening now. We've got some awesome things planned with them over the next few weeks that I think you'll enjoy. So please stay tuned, but now browse on over to their site and see if your dream car is the next one across the block.